Good evening. Thank you so much for coming on this really rainy and drizzly af afternoon. So I know you could be home and warm and cozy, but you decided to join us tonight and we really appreciate it. Tonight's uh, program is being sponsored by the Women and Gender Studies Program and the Committee on Lectures. I'm Gloria Jones Johnson, Director of the Women and Gender Studies Program here at Iowa State University. Thanks so much for coming. Our guest tonight is Dr. Minaski Gigi Durham. She's affectionately called Gigi. Dr. Durham is a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication with a joint appointment in Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Iowa. She's head of the Iowa Center for the Study of Communications. She was on faculty at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Texas at Austin before her arrival at the University of Iowa in 2000. She received her PhD in Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Dr. Durham was featured in the documentary, Misrepresentation, which has been reviewed and discussed here on Iowa State's campus. And this documentary discusses the media image of women. And it was just really fascinating to see how many of you have seen the documentary on campus and how many of you, of you today who've met her greeted her with such enthusiasm. Oh, I saw you in the documentary. That was really uh, a nice treat. Uh, Dr. Durham has received many awards since she has been at the University of Iowa alone. She's received the Collegiate Scholar Award, the Faculty Scholar Award, the Oberman Scholar Award, the Career Development Award, and the Outstanding Faculty Member Award, all since she has been at the University of Iowa since 2000. She has a co-authored book in 2011 called Media and Cultural Studies Keywords. She has a single authored uh, best-selling book that she will share the findings with us tonight called The Lolita Effect, The Media Sexualization of Young Girls and What We Can Do About It. It's really nice to have a book that gives solutions to the problems. She also has a book under contract with the University of Michigan Press called Techno Sex, Technologies of the Body, Mediated Sexualities, and the Quest for the Sexual Self. Sounds like another um, uh, bestseller. We're looking forward to that one. She has published many refereed articles in journals such as Journalism Studies, Journal of Children and the Media, Feminist Media Studies, and Popular Communications. Gigi's work centers on media and the politics of the body with an emphasis on gender, sexuality, race, and youth cultures. Her professional journalism experience includes reporting, editing, and design for various newspapers and magazines, including the Pensacola News Journal, The Times of India, and Science Today. There will be a brief reception following uh, uh, Dr. Durham's presentation over there, and you'll um, please stay long enough to interact and uh, get to know Dr. Durham a little bit with our refreshments. With no further ado, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Gigi Durham. So thank you, Gloria, for that really warm introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. It's great to see such a big crowd. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you tonight here at Iowa State. Um, I'm always excited to share my work with like-minded people who have an interest in society and culture and gender. Um, and I always enjoy talking, especially with students, um, as you're sort of on the front lines of many of the issues that I deal with in my research. And um, you always have interesting perspectives and things to say about the, the kind of work that I do. And I'm always glad to hear from you about it. Um, so I hope there'll, there'll be some time, you know, there will be some time for discussion. And I'm really interested in hearing your questions and comments and so on. Um, 
So some of you may have been following, you know, some of the controversies recently about um, the media and the sexualization of girls. For example, um, last year, Abercrombie and Fitch um, had a product that was called the Ashley Bikini Top. It was a padded push-up bra for preteens. As Elsie Granderson wrote on the CNN website, the purpose of a push-up bra is to enhance sex appeal by lifting up, pushing together, and basically showcasing the wearer's breasts. And now eight-year-olds can do this too. <laughs> But Abercrombie and Fitch are not alone. So I'm actually going to begin my presentation by running through a few images that I've pulled from various media sources and just let you look at them. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to sort of go through some of these images that I've been collecting over the years that I've been doing this kind of research. And apologies that they're kind of stretched out in weird ways on this. OK, I said I wasn't going to say anything, but I can never resist it can, if I go back one. Can you see the similarity in the costumes? <laughs> All right, I still can't resist it. So this, this is an image that I pulled from Vanity Fair, which is, you know, just an ordinary magazine. Um, but if you, if you look closely at this image, I mean, you can see that she's in a very sort of eroticized, sexualized position. You know, her hair is all sort of spread out, and she's got this, she's on a bed or something, and she's got this kind of come heather look on her face. But if you actually look down at her body, and you look, you know, you look further, I guess not enough of this image is showing here. I wish, I don't know if I can, let me see if I can make it smaller for you. Um, I guess that shows a little bit more of the whole image. But if you look, if you look at her body, you can see that her, her chest is completely flat. She's not developed at all, this, this girl. Um, she doesn't have breasts. So I don't know, how old would you say she was, actually? Can take a guess? Nine. Nine? What do you think? Yeah, this, well, nine going on 22, right. I mean, she's actually like, what, maybe nine, 10, 11. I mean, she's, she hasn't matured yet, right? She's, she has a totally flat chest. She's, her body is the body of a prepubescent child, and yet she's styled like this in this really erotic, you know, with the, the garment open and, you know, her breasts exposed and everything. And this was not like child pornography or anything. This was in Vanity Fair, which is a totally mainstream magazine. So, and there was nothing. There was no hue and cry. There was no furor. Nobody protested this ad. It was just there, and I just happened to come across it and take a picture of it. So, um, and, you know, for me, it's just sort of an, an example of how this is very much part of our everyday environment. Um, and again, this is from French Vogue, and the, the model is 10 years old. And again, you can see that she's in a very eroticized, you know, sort of sexy pose, and um, she's wearing, you know, stiletto heels. Her face is made up like an adult's face. Um, uh, so, you know, she's definitely being presented as an adult and in a very sort of, uh, again, an erotic kind of position, but she's 10 years old. And this one, to me, takes the cake. This is a peekaboo pole dancing toy that was sold by the British company Tesco. It's got a, you know, a little plastic pole and a little fake money and a little garter belt, right? And it's, you know, it was on the Toys and Games website. So, so little kids could be pole dancers, you know, strippers, pole dancers, if they wanted to. Now, this one, there was a big outcry about it, and they eventually pulled it off their, you know, their children's toys part of their website. But they still market it. I don't know what they market it as, exercise or something. Who knows? Um, so, um, you know, and these are, these are just a few examples. I've been studying this for years, and I mean, really, these sorts of, um, uh, you know, this sorts of sexualization of childhood is, is very per pervasive in our culture, and of girlhood in particular. Um, I want to start off my talk by saying that I am a pro-sex feminist. And I define that as meaning that I truly believe sex is a normal, natural, healthy part of human existence, and that we need to be, <clears throat> excuse me, far less squeamish about discussions of sexuality than we are. So that's the starting point for discussing the ideas um, that I offer in my recent book, The Lolita Effect, which I'm here to talk about today. Um, the book is called The Lolita Effect. Some, sometimes people ask me about the title. It actually is a reference to Lolita who is the 12-year-old heroine of the eponymous 1958 Vladimir Nabokov novel by the same name, Lolita. In the book, the child is seduced, sexually used, and practically enslaved by her stepfather. But the book is written with such guile and wit that the reader finds himself or herself actually empathizing with the pedophile. If you really think about Lolita, the character, you realize that the child was the victim, as any child in such a circumstance would be. But that's not the way we talk about her. 
In popular culture, this term Lolita has become our code word for a little girl or a teenager who is precociously sexy, who seduces older men, who is inappropriate in the way she presents herself. She's too sexy too soon, to use the words of Jean Kilborn and Diane Levin, who've also written about this subject. We tend to condemn Lolitas. We see them as the problem, instead of turning our attention to a culture that's created them. Not that I think sex is a taboo subject, or that children should need to be shielded from any understanding of sexuality. In fact, I believe sex is not only a natural and normal part of being human, it's a natural part of growing up. I think children deserve accurate, factual, age-appropriate information about sex at different points during their lives, and that such information should be geared to helping them reach maturity and making good decisions for themselves as adults. But that is not what they're getting in today's media-saturated environment which the research shows they turn to for their information about sex, rather than their parents, their teachers, or even their peers. My concern is that sexuality is being shaped and defined by a corporate media system, which presents multiple problems that I'll deal with today. I have spent more than a decade analyzing representations and messages about sexuality in the mainstream commercial media, especially media targeted to children and adolescents. I want to mention that I've done a number of analyses of media uh, Professor Jones Johnson mentioned a few of them in her introduction, um, but I've, had, I, I've published a great deal of work um, analyzing media representations of gender and sexuality. And I've also done ethnographic work with adolescent girls in middle schools and peer group settings. And what I found is that rather than being a source of accurate, useful, thoughtful information about sex, the media is a font of distorted, unrealistic, and even damaging notions about sex that are not in kids' best interests, and especially not in girls' best interests. Several studies show that the sexual content in media aimed at children is rising. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation study found that over the past 20 years, there's been an overall increase in the number of portrayals and the amount of talk about sex in, the, in these media, and an increase in the explicitness of the portrayals. Now that's not necessarily bad in and of itself, but the research also shows that less than one half of 1% of this content is about healthy sexual practices or about sexual health at all. And research also shows, as I said, that kids rely on the media rather than on parents or even peers for their sexual information. So they're not, what they're getting from the media is really not helpful. And we're seeing outcomes in terms of girls' sexual health that are not encouraging. The teen pregnancy rate in the US dropped very slightly last year for the first time in a very long time, but we still have teen pregnancy rates that are higher than every other industrialized country, twice as high as the UK, three times as high as France and Germany, seven times as high as Japan. And we also have very high teen STI rates. So clearly girls are not, in fact, a recent CDC study said that one in four girls between 13 and 19 in the US has a sexually transmitted infection, one in four. So clearly girls are not getting the information about sex that's helping them to make good decisions for themselves. While it's difficult to prove causality, some of these outcomes may be linked to these, the, the mediated myths of sexuality that circulate widely in our society. I've identified the most common myths. There are five of them in my book, and I'll discuss each one during my talk. But before I do, I want to address this term sexualization that I use in the title of the book. You know, it's called the, the subtitle is the media sexualization of young girls and what we can do about it. This is a term that's actually used, that was developed by the American Psychological Association to describe sexual representat representation that's objectifying, um, degrading, or sexist, or otherwise inaccurate or harmful. It's vastly different from a concept of sexuality that's healthy, accurate, and progressive. So the myths that I've identified are myths of sexualization, and they work because they've become accepted as real in our society. In this way, I'm actually uh, using the term myth, as Roland Barthes did, the French philosopher, to describe a rhetorical figure that's become natural and works in the world as if it were real, until a myth analyst comes along to deconstruct and disable it. So it's not necessarily based in any reality, but it has real impact. So um, I'm going to go through and discuss each of the five myths that make up the Lolita effect and talk a little bit about each one of them tonight.
Okay, so the first one, and these are based on, as I said, extensive analyses of a great deal of media that are aimed at teenagers and children. So I looked at TV shows, I looked at movies, I looked at websites, I looked at video games, I looked at magazines, print media. So I, you know, my research sort of spanned a whole gamut of media, most of which was directed at children, targeted to children. Um, so the first myth of girl sexuality is if you've got it flaunted. So there are, of course, two parts to that myth. The first is the condition that a girl needs to have it, whatever it is. And if she does, then she must signal her sexuality by flaunting it, usually by bearing as much of her body as possible. Now, I don't think bodies are scandalous, and I don't think we need to revert to some Victorian notion of swaddling girls from head to foot. No, no, I think bodies are great, and there's nothing shameful about them, right? We don't need to tra treat them as though they were secret. But the problem is that in the media, Desirability is always linked to female body display, and exhibitionism is portrayed as empowering and daring. So to me, that's a pretty narrow definition of something as complex as desire, and there are problems with the simple equation of exhibitionism as power. In these representations, sex is defined via a very unequal power relationship in which girls are the objects of male viewing pleasure and in which boys tend to arbitrate and judge girls' desirability based on purely physical criteria. Criteria, I might add, that are dictated by the media and marketing machines. So there's no mutuality at work here. Uh, there's no equity in the relationship. In the media, they don't show girls gazing at boys the same way boys gaze at girls. I mean, this may happen in real life, but they never show it in the media. It's always the girls on dis almost always. I get, you know, there, there are some representations of men that are sexualized, but overwhelmingly it's girls that are shown as, as objects of, male, of the male gaze. And if you've noticed too, boys' fashions are more and more covered up now, you know, with big baggy pants and big sweatshirts and things like that, while girls are encouraged to bear more and more skin via fashions that actually resonate with sex work, corsets, thongs, fishnet hose, stiletto heels. I mean, these are things that originated in strip clubs, basically. So girls are bombarded with the idea that this constitutes girl power, when in fact it delivers quite the opposite. It puts girls in the disempowered position of being gazed at. The media, like, the, like this Seventeen magazine, let me see if I can get back to it. Oh, there it was. Yeah, so like the Seventeen cover, they tell girls over and over that what really matters is to be hot. See, 405 ways to look hot at every party, dress like a celebrity, get sexy eyes, and then after all that, boost your confidence? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so there's no value, it appears, in any other trait artistic ability or intelligence or scientific aptitude or, you know, spirituality or community spirit. You know, none of this is ever emphasized. The ideal media girl is one dimensional. Only her hotness matters, which is really limiting girls from developing their full multiple potentials and becoming fully realized human beings. The whole emphasis is on being hot. That's all that matters. So the second part of that myth, you know, is that the hotness depends on having it, and it gets defined as the anatomy of a sex goddess, the thin yet voluptuous body. If a Barbie doll were translated to human proportions, and there have been medical analyses of this, she'd be a five foot nine woman with an 18 inch waist, 36 inch breasts, 33 inch hips, and she would weigh 110 pounds. Now, According to these medical analyses, that's too skinny to menstruate. It's too skinny to stand upright. She'd just fall right over with those big breasts and that skinny body. But that is the body that all young girls are encouraged to acquire. It's the body of all the Disney princesses, all the models in catalogs, all the actresses in teen television shows and films, all the idealized pop singers. So it's not surprising that on Facebook and MySpace sites, young girls are asking each other about diet pills and laxatives that will help them to lose dramatic amounts of weight, that 90% of all eating disorders are girl, uh, occur among girls and women, nor that the number of teenage girls getting breast implants has tripled in the past five years. In fact, the Barbie body is pretty much unattainable for girls without borderline starvation and plastic surgery because if anyone were that thin, they would not be that voluptuous. The two things don't go together in nature. If you get that thin, you lose weight everywhere, including in the breasts. So if you're going to be that thin, the only way to get that voluptuous figure is through artificial means. It's a totally artificial body. It really does take excessive sort of starvation and exercise as well as 
you know, uh, cosmetic surgical modification to attain. But and that actually brings me to the main point I want to make about that. The Barbie body is idealized not because it's a social or cultural standard, it's a commercially profitable body. Because attaining it calls for vast amounts of consumption. The consumption of diet aids, plastic surgeries, cosmetics, body slimming undergarments like Spanx, skin treatments, fashion including high heeled shoes and on and on and on. The ideal body has to be unattainable and audiences have to be made to believe that it can be attained through consumerism in order to sustain the multi-billion dollar industries that depend on this dynamic. So if you stop to think about it, the media actually, all of their revenues come from advertising. So their main job is to de deliver audiences to advertisers and to convince audiences to buy the products that the advertisers are, are um, peddling. Um, if you knew, um, if you think more, if you learn more about how media economics works, um, magazines it, or even like well, magazines in particular, they don't depend on circulations. It doesn't matter. Subscription money is peanuts to them. So that's why you can get, you know, two years for $12 or something like that. The real money comes from the advertising. And so they, in order to survive, and they, they, have, to, they have to generate content that, that encourages audiences to buy the products that are being advertised. So the advertisers will continue to pay for the advertising in the, mag in the magazines. It's the same with television shows. Um, with most traditional media and increasingly with the web. So if I just stop for a minute, um, I'm just gonna ask you, how much do you think a one page advertisement in one issue of Seventeen magazine costs? Take a guess. 50,000 more. 500,000. Actually you're close, it's $250,000. So $250,000 the last time I checked for one ad in one issue of Seventeen magazine, okay? So you think about that. How many ads are in each issue of the magazine and how many issues are published a year? This quickly runs into the millions, into the billions, actually. So these are indeed multi-billion dollar uh, revenues for the, for the media. This is what they're depending on. And so they have to portray images of ideal bodies that will um, you know, spur consumerism, you know, so that people will feel insecure about their bodies, they will try to attain those ideal images, and they will spend tons of money doing it. So, you know, so it's all a, a big profit game. Um, in fact, Seventeen Magazine earned, these are the latest figures I could find, $101.9 million in ad revenue in 2006. Online teen people had $77 million, and ad online advertising in 2009 totaled $6.3 billion. So, you know, it's not small change. There's a lot of money invested in portraying these images. Um, the third myth. <clears throat> the third myth is probably the most troubling one to me. I call it pretty babies. And it's the insistent idea that the younger a girl is, the sexier she is. In a way, this isn't a new idea. You know, I think, though it has, I mean, this, I, I, it is it is, and it isn't. Um, it has a few precedents. Some of us in the audience are old enough to remember um, the 14-year-old Brooke Shields um, in the very suggestive Calvin Klein jeans campaigns of the 1970s. But she was an anomaly. I mean, actually, when Brooke Shields was 14 and she was in an ad, it caused great consternation and shock because that it wasn't normally done. Today, very young models are used in most advertising and marketing campaigns. And that Louis Vuitton ad I showed is actually not that unusual these days. Um, the young girls are sometimes made up to look older than they are. And they're almost always dressed provocatively and erotically. These 12 and 13 year old children appear in media targeted to teens and preteens, as well as in media targeted to adults. So Vanity Fair, children don't use, read that magazine. That's definitely for adults. And that's perhaps the most troubling aspect of these representations is it's telling adults that young adolescent girls, sometimes even preteen girls, are both legitimate objects of sexual desire and fully capable sexual actors. That's a very powerful message that's being sent out by the use of young girls in these ads, right? That we're supposed to look at, at them sexually, we're supposed to get turned on by them, and we're supposed to see them as legitimate sexual beings. Um, they may be sexual, but they're not capable of acting sexually. None of those things are true. Girls at 12, 13 are not cognitively or emotionally or psychologically or even physically capable of dealing with sexual activity. They're too young to understand the risks, rights, and responsibilities of sex, but they're being presented in the media as fully-fledged sexual actors. This is a very, very different um, case than, you know, from the way things were in past eras. For example, 
Marilyn Monroe was almost 30 when she appeared in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Sophia Loren was 23 years old in Desire Under the Elms. These were grown women with grown women's bodies, not the bodies and minds of children. Focusing on very young girls as the ideal sexual beings is a dangerous trend in light of our very high rates of child sexual abuse and in light of the proliferating and again multi-billion dollar child prostitution and pornography industries, which UNICEF estimates involves 1.2 million children worldwide and generates over $12 billion a year. It also gives grown women a very damaging message that fully mature adult women are not sexually desirable and that they should strive for the bodies of pre-adolescents in order to be attractive, which is of course impossible for someone who's 30 or 40 or 50. You know, which 40 year old is going to be able to look like a 10 year old? So we need to ask ourselves why them and why should they, right? I mean, why should they be trying to look like 10 year olds? So we need to ask ourselves why the media so insistently emphasizes juvenility as a criterion for ideal sexuality and why grown women are being replaced by little girls in this area. And I'm just going to pause for a minute and ask you what your thoughts are about that. Why are we seeing this? Why are little girls being positioned as sexual beings so much more than they used to be? What do you think? What's going on? the reason for it and I'm only asking you because I'm not sure I have good answers for this and I would like to hear what you have to say yeah I think part of it has to do with money uh -huh. and in consumers are becoming younger and younger because they have more access to capital so on, on some level there's more there's more money floating around there's more money available and the so, marketing companies are looking for the next the next target market so, so they're
that, but uh, the comment here was that as women gain more access to the public sphere, as women become more powerful, as they become secretaries of state, heads of state, entering the workforce, right, you know, managers and companies, as women gain more social power, there's more of a need to, um, it's almost a way to put women back in their place to construct this image of very childish, infantilized, vulnerable, weak femininity as the ideal rather than the strong, powerful, adult, mature woman, right? Um, so, so it's sort of a, a social backlash against women's progress. I don't know if that's the case or not. It's, a, it's, a, it's potentially a theory, right? Because it's really difficult to figure out why exactly we need to position 10-year-olds as sexual, right? I mean, there's no, there's no good reason for that, but it's happening more and more and more. And we really need to ask ourselves as a society, what the heck is going on? Why is this happening? Uh, because again, it's putting children in extremely dangerous positions. They're the most vulnerable um, segment of our population. And, you know, in a sense, we have a responsibility to treat children well. I mean, you can tell how well a society is doing by how well his children are doing. And we're not doing a very good job right now. Um, okay, so the next myth. But thank you all for those ideas, because I'm just going to, oh, before I go on, I wanted to show you this, this video. Let's see if I can make, the, make it work. Hang on. Actually, I think I've got it queued up on Firefox here, so. Okay, let me see if I can get this thing to play. <laughs> Seven years old. I mean, the, the, the captions these seven years old, old girls. They're you know dressed like strippers. They're kind of you know cavorting and you know uh, dancing in a very provocative kind of way. And it's interesting to look at the comments on YouTube because there's almost no critique. It's wow, what great dancers! Wow, look at those moves. I couldn't have done that when I was seven. And no one is saying these girl, these little girls are like you know, uh, acting out in, in ways that are very, very rem reminiscent of sort of sex, you know, sex clubs or sex workers. And, you know, what the heck is going on here? So again, it's becoming very normal in society to see very young children in these sorts of positions. Okay, so let me just tick through my myths here. Okay. Okay, so the fourth myth is that violence is sexy. In my book, I also examine the increasing linkage of sex with violence, usually perpetrated by boys or men against girls, as it's portrayed. This is, of course, a very real problem in our society and one that should be discussed and represented. But in a great deal of commercial media, it's not represented as a serious problem. Rather, it's glorified and celebrated. So in slasher films, for example, like the Hostel series or a vast range of video games, especially the notorious Grand Theft Auto series, graphic violence is connected with male arousal. Women or girls in revealing outfits or sexual situations designed to arouse your average heterosexual male, you know, are in, you know, usually in sort of sexual positions just when the killer strikes in horror movies, just when the mayhem occurs. So just when male viewers are most aroused, violence against women happens. For adolescents and younger boys, I think this is a very powerful developmental message that violence is sexy. In video games, women frequently appear as sex workers, strippers, prostitutes, go-go dancers, dominatrices, you know, many games are like this, as though there are no other job options for women. And their bodies are, again, juxtaposed with violence. The violence isn't always against the women, but there, you know, there's a great deal of violence and there's a great deal of, you know, sort of portrayal of women in very sexual ways. And although many of these games are rated, they're all rated, studies show that most young teenage boys have played games for mature audiences and seen films with R or NC-17 ratings. Again, we're seeing rising rates of teen dating violence in this country. It's difficult to prove causality. I'm not going to say that everybody who's ever played or watched a, you know, a violent video game is just immediately going to run out and hurt somebody. But we do have to ask, is the overt celebration of sexual violence in the media helping or hurting girls or women? I mean, these are the questions I want to ask. Is it contributing to a climate um, where, again, it's naturalizing and normalizing violence against women and especially sexual violence? Or is it countering it? And it's not countering it. Um, there's another clip I wanted you to, to watch. Let me see if I hope that one works. Um, this is about some of you may have heard about them, the hentai video games that are really, um, well, you'll see.
This report includes graphic content. Viewer discretion is advised. The heart of Japan's electronics district, the world's games of tomorrow on sale today. On shelves in mainstream stores, plenty of what's known here as hentai games. Almost all feature girlish looking characters. Some are violent, depicting rape, torture, and bondage in detail. Didn't take long to find a game where the object is revenge. Find and rape the woman who fired the player from his imaginary job. Most of this game we cannot show you. Hentai games are not new for Japan. This country has long produced products the rest of the world would call pornographic. But before the internet shrunk the world, it stayed here. A quick web search generates hundreds of Japanese games. Once a game goes on sale in Tokyo, it's digitized and shared everywhere. This one, called Rape Lay, begins with a teenage girl on a subway platform. With a click of your mouse, you can grope her and lift her skirt. You, the player, stalk her, her sister, and her mother following them on the train. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. Players can corner the women to rape them again and again, and it goes on from there. The game infuriated women's rights groups. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so these are games where the object is to rape um, girls. And you get points. You get points for groping, molesting, and uh, you know, raping them over and over. Um, so these are the types of things. And again, we just have to ask, are they helping or are they hurting? <sighs> the fifth myth is called what boys like. In most of the media I analyze that's targeted to young girls, Sexuality is constructed in terms of pleasing boys, attracting the male gaze, figuring out how to get him to crush on a girl, and so on. And let me just go back to those magazine covers so you can see that. Okay, so I know you've all seen like this, but things like this, but let's, uh, you know, look at the cover lines. What boys really want, eight secrets you need to know, how to get him to crush on you, be the girl everyone loves, right? I mean, it's, it's always about, um, it's always, there's always this sort of mysterious he that's back there looking on. Oops. <clears throat> So, you know, there's never any discussion of girls' own pleasures. You know, there's never about their agency, their comfort zones. There's never a representation of an ethical or equitable sexual relationship. It's always about girls changing themselves to please boys. It's always looking for what he wants, what he needs. Um, and you, there's no comparable, there are no comparable magazines for boys. There's nothing for young boys that's all about, you know, how they should change themselves to please girls or, you know, how they should, you know, whatever, learn how to be in a good relationship or anything. That's, that's not out there. We find from the research, again, that as a result, girls don't know how to set boundaries. Studies show that girls don't know where to get contraception, don't know how to say no in a sexual situation, don't know how to set their own boundaries. As I've said earlier, we have the highest teen pregnancy rates in the industrialized world and very high rates of teen STIs in the US. Could it be because girls are never given any guidance on how to handle sexuality in practical, sensible, and ultimately responsible ways? Never to think about what they want, never to f focus on their own sexual pleasures and needs and desires, also their own rights in a sexual relationship? The emphasis is always on, on the boy, it's always on seeking to please men. <clears throat> So those are the basic five myths, and I'm sure as you look at media, you'll recognize them popping up. Maybe you've already sort of recognized this pattern in the media that you've seen. Um, these myths, though, they don't just circulate in the U.S. They're global. Um, and that's, that's the next part, you know, of the Lolita effect. In an era of transnational media, we're seeing these myths of sexuality penetrate cultures that had different understandings and approaches to sex, some of which were actually far more progressive and diverse than those contained in the myths. The ideal of the Barbie body, for example, is displacing other cultures' more realistic standards of beauty. And as I was researching this book, I discovered that traditionally in Brazil, the ideal feminine body was what they called a guitar-shaped body with small breasts and large hips. And now that's been completely changed by the Western impossible model of extreme thinness and very large breasts that, you know, so now plastic surgeries, everybody's getting them all over South America to try to conform more to this Western standard. The same way traditionally Asian standards were smaller and slighter with smaller breasts, but that's out the window now too. So, um, so these, these media-driven standards of Western beauty are 
uh, pen, you know, permeating the world. In the same way, the hookup culture of sexuality, um, you know, which is sort of a part of the myth that I talked about first, where sex is presented in part only all about appearance, but also as g glamorous and, uh, you know, no strings attached and, you know, never, and, and there are never sort of any real world consequences to it in the way it's portrayed in most media aimed at kids. Um, this kind of hookup culture of sexuality is actually displacing more considered and self-directed decisions about having sex in other cultures. The cultural collisions caused by these myths in the global media scape are sometimes putting girls in very dangerous and vulnerable situations too. For example, the so-called honor killing. Sometimes girls are uh, punished severely physically, sometimes even with, with death for, you know, wearing Western fashions or engaging in these sorts of sexual behaviors. I'm not saying it's the girl's fault, but it's just that these kinds of myths are circulating in ways that are causing even more problems for girls. So we need to be aware that these myths are not just harming girls in this country, they're wreaking havoc with girls worldwide. So <clears throat> what can we do about all this? I could be one of those academics who just defines the problem and then says, okay, now you deal with it and I'll go back to my ivory tower and I'll write another book. Um, but no, that wasn't why I wrote this book to begin with. And in fact, there are effective real world ways to counter the myths and enable girls to be critical, proactive media consumers who can make good decisions about their sexual lives. That's the goal. So in the book, I urge, first of all, parents to talk about all of this with their daughters. Before these conversations can happen, though, the caring adults in the world need to become familiar with the tools of media analysis, and that's a key part of the book. As adults, we all need to understand and recognize these myths and their manifestations, and then to work on helping children to recognize and resist them, too. Maintaining open channels of communication about the media, sexuality, and myth is crucial. This has to be done in a friendly, calm, responsive way. Lecturing kids is usually not a productive tack, though it has to happen sometimes. But you know, the thing, you know, you're, you're not gonna wear that go, you know, over my dead body, that's usually gonna make them wanna wear it more, right? So you can't have those kinds of confrontational um, interactions. You know, you have to be sort of supportive. But starting conversations that help children become critical consumers is very effective, and these can start very early. Um, actually, when I went into um, middle schools and I talked with girls, and I did find some that were very, um, you know, they were thinking about college, they were looking ahead, they were not too impressed by any of these mediated uh, ideals, and I, I would sit down and I'd ask them, so what makes you this way? What makes you so critical? And almost always they said it's because my mom or some other adult sat down and talked with me about this. So, you know, was there, usually it was their mother, sometimes it was a dad, sometimes it was a teacher or counselor or somebody like that, but somebody had helped them sort of think about this better, and that sort of had helped them to, you know, gain some distance from it and deal with it, um, you know, more practically and in a way that was better for them. So really having conversations is great. And really they can start very, very early too. Um, I've got I've got two daughters myself, and when they were really young, when they were like two years old, I would begin not talking about sexuality, but if we saw like a cereal commercial or something, I'd say, why do you think they're telling us that that sweet cereal is part of a healthy, nutritious breakfast when we know it's just sugar, we know it's just garbage? So they would think about that, and it would kind of help them to develop more of a critical consciousness. So yeah, these advertisers are telling us that that candy in a bowl is healthy, and we know it's not. Or like when we were watching Disney or something, I'd say, do you really think people, anyone could breathe with a waist that thin? Do you really think she could stand up on legs that skinny? And they would go, oh, ha, 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 no, I don't think anybody could really breathe if they were that skinny. And they would start to, you know, make a distinction between fact and, and reality, between fact and fiction. And so it just helped them to become a little bit more critical, a little bit more aware, so that as they grow older, then we could have more conversations about the constructions of sexuality. So it's never too early. You can really start these conversations with kids when they're very young. Um, and then I find that giving girls a space to be critical can help. I found in my interviews with young teenage girls and in the workshops that I've done in schools that they are relieved when they can actually unleash their critiques of media representations without any pushbacks, you know, without any pushback, because they're smart. I mean, some of them have actually noticed these things before. They are critical, but they've never like been given the, the freedom to actually talk about it. They're too, you know, people are conforming so much all around them that they, they don't feel safe about expressing a dissenting opinion. And when you give them that, that kind of space, they run with it. It's great. Um, so I, th you know, I feel as though in the schools it would be really important to develop. And some of you perhaps are education majors, counseling majors, things like that. So you know, developing you know uh, group um, pr processes where people can talk, where girls can talk about this stuff is really important. Um, 
In addition, parents and teachers can encourage girls to be active media creators themselves. Um, you know, so if they get out these days, it's so easy. You can blog, you can shoot your own movies, you can take pictures, right? My, my daughter, when she was like nine years old, wrote a script and, you know, shot a movie with her our video camera with her friends in it and stuff. So if they, if you encourage them to produce their own media, very often it gives them the, uh, the recognition, it gives them the realization that media are constructions and they can write their own narratives that are different from the ones that are being circulated all around them. Um, they can tell their own stories. I'm also a big proponent of school-based media literacy education. I feel as though media literacy is as important in this media saturated environment as reading, writing, arithmetic, that they have to learn how to be media analysts. And I would really, really like to see it integrated into the curriculum. Um, I also think that there could be parenting groups and other, uh, you know, other forms of public education about these topics. I should emphasize that I'm not pro censorship. I think free speech is incredibly important. If we censored sexual content, then my book would probably be censored. So, you know, I'm not at all about censorship. Um, you know, it's a really slippery slope. On the contrary, I believe in public discussions, education and critical analysis. In fact, more freedom of speech around these topics is a way to take control of our media environments and our own lives. We do live in a media saturated environment. On a typical day, a young person is faced with a media environment that includes more than 200 cable television networks, 5,500 mag consumer magazine titles, 10,500 radio stations, and 30 million or more websites. Market research indicates that children and teenagers in particular are major media consumers. U.S. teens spend between $124 and $190 billion a year, a significant portion of which is spent on electronics and media. The media are a prevailing presence in the lives of contemporary youth. A 2005 Kaiser Family Foundation study found that 8 to 18 year olds spend an average of six and a half hours a day with media. According to the marketing firm Teen Research Unlimited, American teenagers spend 11.2 hours a week watching TV, 10.1 hours listening to FM radio, 3.1 hours a week playing video games. Teens and young adults spend 16.7 hours a week online. Both boys and girls rank MTV as their favorite cable channel, spending an average of six hours a week watching it. And I should have mentioned that music videos were also part of my analysis, and you all know what I found there, right? <laughs> um, these numbers actually hold true across racial groups as well. Nearly half of all black youth and a third of Latino youth watch rap music programming several days a week, with a quarter watching it daily. So we know the media are a huge part of our lives and the media corporations make profits running into billions of dollars annually. All of this should be a red flag that we can't just dismiss the media as harmless entertainment or background noise. We have to take it seriously as a cultural factor with enormous significance and impact, especially in the realm of gender and sexuality and especially where kids are concerned. So I wanna end with a quote from two women who have deeply inspired me. The first is from the psychologist Mary Pfeiffer. And she wrote, in an ideal culture, sexual decisions should be the result of intentional choices. And I love this, you know, not coercion, not because people think it's the thing they have to do, not social pressure, but intentional, you know, intentional and consensual, I would add to that. And the second is from the anthropologist Margaret Mead who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So that for me is really inspiring and is why I keep doing this work. And at this point, I'm actually really interested in your thoughts, your comments, and your questions about all this. I'm sure you all have a great deal of experience with it from perspectives that are different from my own, and I'd love to hear about them. So thanks for allowing me to say my piece, and I'd like to engage in a dialogue with you. There's microphones up, or you can just hold up your hands, and I'd be glad to talk about any of this. Thanks again. And really, I am interested. I want to hear what you have to say.
Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm a retired teacher counselor uh, from 39 years in four different high schools. Uh, and uh, over that period of time, I worked uh, with a lot of parents. Uh, and I think, uh, and I tried to have parenting classes, but I could not generate much interest. Uh, and I just think parenting is a huge piece of this. Uh, we can't change the culture uh, in the world today, the, the technology, the media, uh, but I think it has to start at home with the parents. Uh, and it also has to be in, your, in our school systems uh, with uh, an integrated, and part of what I taught at one period of time was health education and a unit on what we called family values. Uh, and uh, I had parents uh, that, uh, a parent, one parent in particular, that didn't want me to teach anything other than just say no. Yeah. And uh, her daughter at that time was dating a 20 year old. And uh, yeah, just and no wasn't going to get her. She was <laughs> the first one in that class to get pregnant. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. but, uh, and, and the other complication is uh, the, the, you know, the, the mentality today in education is core subjects. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, testing, right. uh, race to the top, right. uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. And what gets left out? Well, uh, things like what we're talking about yeah. here. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure, I've just moved from Illinois, but uh, in Illinois, uh, there is a provision that parents can withdraw their, their health education is required uh, to, for high school credit. However, parents can take their kids out of the unit on sex education. It's the same here. Mm -hmm. It's an option. Yep. And that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first yeah. of all, I applaud you as a teacher. This is great. The work that you and counselors and everybody here who's an education major, teachers are incredibly influential in kids' lives, and you do a wonderful job, And you know, so thank you. And then um, the other thing, if I could just take another minute here, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think a, a lot of times parents can't wait for their kids to grow up. Mm -hmm working with with parents and students parents can't wait for their kids to get a car and drive even though it's the most dangerous thing they'll ever do mm -hmm. uh, and i i think a parent sometimes want their little girls to grow up too fast mm -hmm. uh, and they encourage this they and do. so a, a parent uh, thought it was so cute that her daughter was pretty attractive, very young, and allowed her to date as a very young girl. Uh, and uh, she ended up pregnant at age 15. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Uh, we have such high rates of pre teen right. pregnancy in this country. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, we're... It, uh, in many ways, we're, we're such a prudish society yeah. in terms of... If if we just don't talk about it, maybe it won't It'll happen. Go away, yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Well, if I can just respond to that very quickly, though, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head that we have a terrible sort of collision in this country where on the one hand, we're terribly prudish, right? So it's we can't talk about sex, especially we can't talk about sex when it's children are concerned. We can't deal with it. It's all bad, bad, bad. And then on the other hand, we have this kind of libertarian media environment where anything goes and we're not willing to critique anything because we don't want to come across as prudes. But at the same time, we are prudes. And so this terrible collision is causing us to do nothing and to have to sort of release kids to kind of the wild west of the sexual environment. Whereas on the other hand, in, in Europe, for example, Sweden, Scandinavian countries, they have very low rates of teen pregnancy, very low rates of teen STIs and abortion. And it's because they treat sexuality as a public health issue. And they have very frank and open discussions about not just abstinence, but contraception and sexual rights and risks and responsibilities. They deal with it like adults. We don't in this country. We really have a big problem about how we deal with sexuality. And it's, it's, it shows in, in the, the kinds of sexual problems that especially our girls are running into and we've got to do better so thank you uh, first thank you it was a very thought-provoking lecture um, I did have a question uh, in regards to the the myths that you presented what 
research-based evidence do you have to relate that to the teen pregnancies and the teen STIs? Yeah. I mean, I, it seems like it's a problem, but yeah. what kind of results Actually, have Actually, there found? have been a few empirical okay. studies that relate them. You know, as I said, it's very hard to prove causality right. because it's, you know, if you're, are you some sort of social science major? Oh, or, I'm, I'm, I'm just a researcher, so. Pardon? I'm a, re, I'm a graduate or a graduate student researcher, okay. so okay. I'm always kind so, of So, you know, the causality has to depend on that, you know, time, you know, time lapse and things like that. And we can't exactly prove causality in a scientific way here. But there have been some really interesting studies. There was one large scale study that was published in the journal Pediatrics where they surveyed something like uh, 1,500 students. I don't, I might have the data with me somewhere here. And they found that children who were um, exposed to sexualized media early actually engaged in early sex. So that was a very clear correlation. And that, that held true across ethnic groups. So that was very interesting. And it did prove that. There's another recent study uh, conducted by the RAND Corporation that showed that exp uh, early exposure to sexual media was correlated with early teen pregnancy. So we do have some empirical evidence of that. There is research data. How, how strong is that correlation? Uh, it's quite strong because these okay. were large-scale studies, okay. you know, so they, they actually it did hold up pretty well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see more of that, I should say. This research is still in its infancy, but we're, we're starting to see some strong data. Hi, Gigi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to comment and kind of push the question a little bit further because you were talking about um, reaching out to young girls and starting the conversations early. Um, I work here on campus, I'm a graduate assistant also, um, and have done a lot of work with a documentary that Dr. Jones Johnson mentioned called Misrepresentation. So we talk a lot about um, the sexualization of women in the media. And in my experience, um, screening that with college women, it's, um, they take it very positively and, and definitely see that played out in their own lives and are very receptive to it. Um, but my personal experience when I've screened that with men has been very, very negative. Mm. Um, and I get a lot of pushback, um, particularly comments about how women prefer to be at home, prefer to be sexualized. Um, women aren't biologically capable of being in technical fields and being intelligent um, are comments that I get almost weekly on this campus. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just wonder if, you know, we, do we also need to be having these conversations with little boys? We really do. And, and what yes. can we do to help educate our men before they get to be adults that they are also part of this process? And, um, you know, that media consumption, they need to be critical as well that, you yeah. know, men shouldn't act that way in cartoons and magazines and TV shows. So. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things, too, that I mentioned in the book, but I don't go into it in great depth, but it's true, is that, for one thing, men are getting very powerful messages about women from these same media. They're also getting the message that women are eye candy, that women are sex objects, that women, you know, their, their, their job in life is to be hot, right? Because, you know, even on a magazine like Seventeen, for example, they could show a young scientist, they could show a young writer, they could show, you know, a young woman who are, who's uh, engaged in environmental activism but they don't they only show Paris Hilton or whatever you know who did what I don't even know what she did to get on the cover of 17 right but you know those are the kinds of images that we're seeing we're not seeing women who are actually like productive and intelligent and uh, you know doing doing meaningful things in life um, so and men and boys are exposed to the same messages at the same time for me it's really encouraging that there are pro feminist men out there we need men to be our allies in this right so we do need to bring men into these conversations I think when these topics are brought up um, you know circles of girls are a good idea but it's always worthwhile to bring boys into the conversation too so that boys can hear how girls actually feel about this stuff that we don't enjoy being sexually objectified that we don't we don't prefer to be in the kitchen sweeping the floor and having children right or <laughs> whatever it is, whatever myths are out there about, about that, right? So it's important to have sort of, you know, conversations, you know, with everyone included. Um, and uh, I think this, this would hold true in schools, but it could also be useful at the college level where boys could actually hear, men, young men could actually hear that women are not thrilled with this sort of imagery. And that's not the kind of um, uh, life they want to lead, right? That's not, and that doesn't, the other thing about all of that is that it doesn't lead to good relationships. Right. So, so, you know, and these, these are, I mean, I'm going to talk about heterosexual relationships here because those are the most affected by these kinds of images. And if there are problems in relationships, they're often directly tied to the fact that these images don't give us good models for how to have ethical, equitable, considerate, consensual relationships where there's mutual respect. And that actually would read, lead to a whole, you know, a whole lot sort of better, um, you know, better uh, relationships within couples than what we're getting from these media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, another thing I want to say is people always ask me, what about boys? Aren't boys objectified and sexualized in these ways as well, right? And it is happening. You do see that. I mean, it is true that there's more and more, there are more and more images of young, of ideal male bodies that are at just as unrealistic as the ones that are shown for women they're also thin they have impossible pecs and muscles and things and boys are supposed to you know you know work on having those bodies and that's can be just as damaging but it's not as widespread as it is for women we still the statistics are still off the charts it's it's mainly women and girls who suffer from eating disorders it's mainly women and girls who have um, low body image. It's mainly women and girls who undergo plastic surgery. The impact is still, the, the cultural weight behind it still affects women far more than men. And I think men have also other role models, whereas women don't, right? There are men who have achieved, you know, great success in life without conforming to those body types, President Obama, Bill Gates, whatever, you know, and we don't, you know, women aren't given the same sorts of, uh, you know, potential role models as much. <laughs> yeah. That could, yeah, that could be. I mean, at the same time, I don't want to stereotype all 30-year-old white men as being complete sexists either, right? You know, there are a lot of 30-year-old white men who are progressive and open-minded and who, I wish they worked in advertising, though. You know, that's the problem, isn't it? Um, and I also should say that a lot of women are complicit in this. For example, you know, the editors of Cosmopolitan and a lot of fashion editors and things. So women are doing it, too. It's just sort of the dominant ideology that we're in, and it takes a lot of effort to challenge it. So... But yeah, in media studies, you know, we talk about conditions of production, so we have to look at that too. And you know, it's it's important to know who's in the workplace and how they're thinking. And that's why I also teach in the School of Journalism. And I, you know, what I'm hoping is that we can produce young, you know, media producers who will go out there and change things. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yes, absolutely, yes, that's a really good question, and I actually do deal with that in the book, um, but I'll just go back to my slide of Beyonce. <laughs> So here we go. So one of the things that I do talk about is that the representations of girl, for girls and women of color are actually probably even more um, stressful than they are for white girls because um, the, the images of, of women of color that are always presented are women of color that are very, very close to a Caucasian ideal. So they have light skin, they have straight and bleached hair, they tend to look more white. So anybody who has darker skin, you know, uh, t t hair of a different texture, larger lips, you know, broader features, that's automatically considered to be ugly, right? And so the Caucasian ideal is the one that's positioned as the best. And so there's a racialized standard of beauty working here too, where the Caucasian is at the top and the, you know, the more African or other ethnic is towards the bottom. It's the same with body types, like in, in Latino and African American culture, traditionally larger body types were more valued, but now girls of color are suffering from eating disorders at almost the same rates as white girls. So there's definitely, there's a lot of pressure on, on, on girls of color to attain this white standard and it's much harder for them and it costs a whole lot more money to do it as well. So. Um, yeah, and, and as for masculinity, I don't do masculinity studies, but at the same time, there are stereotypes of African American and Latino masculinity that are really, really problematic, you know, that, that buy into sort of the thug, gangsta, you know, rude, crude, sexual beast sort of stereotype, which, you know, really negates a lot of positive qualities that could be developed in Latino and African American boys. So there's a lot of racism in, this, in these media images. Yeah, thanks for asking about that. And, and as oh, the other part of that is these myths circulate globally, right? So in other cultures, for example, skin lightening creams are being sold in Africa and in India. They're often carcinogenic. The, the cheaper brands of the, the skin bleaching creams, they, they actually cause cancer. Sometimes they cause disfigurement and scarring, and yet they're being sold to the dark-skinned women because they're told that their skin has to be lighter. But at the same time, you know, women in the U.S. are engaging in tanning practices, which are also causing cancer. So, you know, everyone is doing things that are harmful to their bodies to try 
try to attain this some whatever that perfect standard is that nobody actually can attain. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, the pretty babies, uh, very young models are used in all sorts of media now, uh, all the way across the board. And when you look at the types of media that are aimed at very young children, uh, you're, you're still seeing very sexualized images, like that birthday card that I showed you for a toddler, right? She's wearing stilettos and fishnet hose, and, you know, it's a very, it's a, I mean, it, at one time, that sort of outfit would have been very much associated with sex work. Um, and the brat dolls, I think, are an example of that. If you look, you know, for, you know, first of all, again, the emphasis is always on a particular type of body, and then the clothes are very low cut, you know, very short, tight skirts, things like that. So, yeah, it's all the way down. And I think someone mentioned that earlier that they are trying to create cradle to grave consumers of these products. They're targeting younger and younger girls because they want the money and they want, you know, younger kids to buy into these ideologies. So they'll keep consuming these products all the way through their lives. So yeah, you're seeing it at media for very young kids. I mean. Who are buying it. Yeah, it's a combination, right? Because the kids don't, yeah, they're not buying it for themselves, right? Little kids especially. The parents are definitely buying these things for them. Uh, I talked to a salesperson once at a department store where they sold padded bras for preteens. And she said they flew off the shelves and it was the parents buying them for the kids. So the media are pushing them really hard, but the parents are buying into it as well. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thanks. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>